Hello and welcome to Schools Not Out, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE students. You can watch this lesson real time on Television Jamaica's YouTube channel or One Spot Media. We are also live on Music 99 and GoJamaica.com. If you have questions on today's subject, you can send them in to Television Jamaica's Facebook page or Instagram at television underscore Jamaica. Today's lesson is on Cape Caribbean Studies, and I am Melissa Beckford Simpson, your teacher for today. Today, we will be focusing on a not-so-loved topic, Caribbean intellectual traditions. Yes, and I can hear you moaning and groaning in your living rooms as you watch this lesson. But it's very important that we know about Caribbean intellectual traditions, and it is my hope that you will learn much today. Okay, so what are we looking for? What are we looking to do today? We're looking to explore the various Caribbean intellectual traditions that exist. We want to define what an intellectual tradition is and what an ideology is. We want to explain how the historical processes of the Caribbean, we can't get away from that, how they have a part to play in our intellectual traditions. We want to give an overview of the, of the African Caribbean, in the Caribbean, indigenous, and economic perspectives that have characterized the Caribbean. And we also want to determine the extent to which these traditions have shaped the way how we live in the Caribbean. All right, so let's get right into it. What is an ideology? Okay, so when somebody says to you, what is your ideology? What does it mean? It is really a worldview or a perspective that shapes the way how we look at and relate to our society, our environment. It, is, it, it stems from a set of values that we have, things that we hold dear to us. And it also is a perspective that is shaped by experiences. An intellectual tradition now becomes an intellectual tradition when an ideology so much shapes the way that people behave that it becomes embedded into the society. So some examples of that, political parties have their own ideology. We have the communist um, ideology or tradition in the Caribbean. And we have many isms and schisms, as Bob Marley say, fighting against the isms and schisms, you know? So we have a lot of that in the Caribbean, a lot of beliefs and perspectives, and they have become a part of who we are as Caribbean people. Okay, so what is the purpose of looking at them? Why well, we don't just go along and we know what we're doing and everybody knows what they're doing. Why do we need to look at it? It's important for us to understand these intellectual traditions because they largely are formulated by our history of uh, oppression, resistance, colonialism, enslavement, and they have led to political, economic, and social awakening. So in other words, it is out of these beliefs and perspectives that we have the kind of Caribbean society that we have today and that we hope to have an even better Caribbean society going forward. One that you, your generation, you are going to be doing Caribbean studies, one that you can appreciate. All right. So it's important that we know why we are doing this. We, it also helps to ground us as Caribbean people. It puts us in a context that help us to deal with globalization. We have to know who we are. Simply put, if we don't know who we are, then we don't know where we are going. How many times have we heard these things? And I, I hear you groaning again. Why do we always have to look at the history and the past? Because it is true. If we don't look at where we're coming from, then we will not know where we're going. I thought Caribbean ideologies and intellectual traditions stem from all of these things. All right, so there are several different kinds of intellectual traditions and thoughts in the Caribbean. We begin with Afro-Caribbean thought. And this is a broad word that incorporates several different ideas, some of which you will be able to identify with. So it's, the term is applied in hindsight, right? And um, it is really used to look at all of those ideas that converge and make us 
who we are and what we stand for as black people, as it says, Afro-Caribbean, right? So people who descended from Africa and who now live in the Caribbean, black people, we are predominantly black. How do these thoughts and ideas shape who we are? It is a convergence of various ideologies that were geared at raising a consciousness amongst us blacks around the world. And these, this kind of consciousness came somewhere about in the early 1900s, going into the mid 1900s and as far as the 1960s, leading us into independence and all of that. All right. So we have black pride. These are the ideas that come out of this Afro-Caribbean thought. Black pride, black nationalism, black justice, meaning that we were living in a kind of society that were not conducive to who we are and what we wanted to achieve as black people. In other words, we were living in a, in, in a continuance of the plantation model type society. One where you had the white elite and the browns and then the blacks at the bottom and that was where we stayed and certain amenities where we were not able to afford. Black unification, wherever black people are in the world, across the Caribbean, North America, Europe, and also on the African continent itself. That kind of unification of us as black people and of course black unity okay so we are looking at pan-africanism coming out of this this afro-caribbean thought and this was the first major idea that came out of the afro-caribbean thought all right so out of that we have had the black power movement and the black panther movement which is connected to it all right, so I hear people saying, yeah, I know Black Panther, not necessarily the one that you know, but the idea of Black Panther existed from the early 1900s. It began with one called Stokely Carmichael. He put forward a kind of militancy for black people, more so young people, in terms of achieving goals and making up the mark that they wanted to make on the society and being somebody. You know, what one of our intellectuals would call smodification, right? And then it continued with Walter Rodney. And then we have the African Black Brotherhood. We have Garveyism coming out of that, our own Garvey. And Negritude, which was prominent in the French departments. That would be Guadeloupe and Martinique and so on. Those that are connected with the former French masters. All right? So that's what we're looking at in terms of um, Pan-Africanism and Afro-Caribbean Afro thought. So this is the symbol of the Black Panther Party in power, a Black Panther in a circle, all right? And these are what we would call a kind of militant group of Black Panthers. They are wearing the symbol um, and they, they are marching in a unified kind of way. So that, it, that is what it really sought to show. All right. Now, Pan-Africanism, let's zero in on Pan-Africanism just a little bit. The movement called Pan-Africanism was started by Caribbean people. Yes, us. And it was then adopted in North America and everywhere that black people are, which is what we call the diaspora. Not a new term. You would have learned this term from you were doing module one. Diaspora, which means anywhere, to break it down, anywhere the grouping of people are in the world, all right? So the black or African diaspora and people on the continent itself, all right? So it was, it, this first Pan-African conference was convened by one, Henry Sylvester Williams, a Trinidadian, and he was the one who organized it in 1900, bringing together a number of Pan-Africanists, other groups, like-minded black people, who believed in the upliftment of the black race, who believed that we needed to understand ourselves, understand who we were, understand our worth, and that we have a history that is worth talking about. Because as some of us historians love to say, we were living in the pyramids of Egypt, black people, and of Nubia, when the white men were still living in caves. So there's a history that we want our own people to know that we are coming from royalty. We are important people, 
right? And this was what Henry Sylvester Williams wanted to put across. All right? And there were other Pan-Africanist leaders, such as George Padmore of Trinidad, Cyril Briggs of Nevis, C.L.R. James of Trinidad, a famous writer we know of C.L.R. James, Marcus Garvey of Jamaica, Claude McKay, another writer, right? Best known for poetry and so on. But steeped in his poetry was this idea of blackness and black unity and black pride and black consciousness. And then we had the Caribbean leaders now influenced persons from other parts of the world. One such notable person would be W.E.B. Du Bois. And Du Bois was an intellectual. He, he has the distinction of being one of the first black persons or the first black person to graduate with a PhD from Harvard University. And for him to have achieved that at the time when he did, because he was born in the 1860s, for him to have achieved that at the time when he did means that he had to undergo a lot of racism because we were talking about a time when black people were not allowed to even mingle with other people in, in, in the American society. We had the Jim Crow laws and so on going on and segregation at its best. So he would have achieved quite a bit and he was an intellectual who had similar ideas to Padmore and Williams and so on. And then we have other Africans now, Africans from the continent of Africa, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. And he was, one, he was the individual who, not single-handedly, but he was very instrumental in leading his country to become the first modern black independent country from the, from the colonial masters, Ghana, independent Ghana. And then you have Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, also, he was instrumental in doing a very similar thing for his country. So the Caribbean leaders, you see how important we are? You see how important we are and how influential we are? Yes, especially Jamaican people. And we love to boast about it. Anywhere we go, then we allow people to be doing something that we carry there. Look at what Bolt did. And he has everybody doing all of that. All over the world, everybody knows that. And that is how influential Caribbean people are. Okay, so the Pan-African leaders began to raise awareness all over the world about the general principles and ideals of the movement. Remember those principles? The black pride and black nationalism and all of those things. They organized conferences. They established newspapers and wrote in these newspapers, um, bringing awareness to people. They organized marches. And a lot of them lost their lives in these marches as well because they were illegal according to the law of the day. They lobbied governments through writing and you know all kinds of ways they, they, they utilized in order to raise awareness and to have rights for black people. So, but there was one thing though, the leaders agreed on what the principles were, the black pride and the black consciousness and all of these things. They believed in all of that, all of them. However, they disagreed <laughs> severely when it came to how they were to achieve these things. And you had people going in different directions. And perhaps in the early days, the movements could have been much more organized if the leaders were together in terms of what and how they wanted to achieve these things. All right? So we move to Marcus Garvey. And we will discuss a little bit more of the divergence of ideas between Marcus Garvey and Du Bois, for example. Now, our own Marcus Garvey, he's our national hero. We know what he looks like, right? But I find it amazing that Garvey is from us, and yet Garvey seems to get the least recognition from us. We seem to know the least about Marcus Garvey. So we need to teach about these things a little bit more. Now, Garveyism, right? We talked about those isms and schisms, right? So Garveyism, it was a thing. And he, he, he founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, in 1914. He founded it here in Jamaica. But he did not get the kind of traction in his own country that he received when he went to North America, to the United States. And it is true what they say, I guess. A king has no honor in his own country. 
And so we did not recognize Garvey for who he was and what he was trying to tell us. However, other people, blacks in other places, embraced Garvey and his teachings. So Garvey migrated to the United States and he established the UNIA even more. And he founded other affiliates to the UNIA, the African Communities League, the Universal African Black Cross Nurses, the Black Star Line, which is a ship that was supposed to repatriate blacks to the continent of Africa, the Negro World, the Black Man, these are his newspapers that he spoke about black consciousness in. All right, so Garvey continued and he established himself and he had a large following to the extent that other leaders were inspired by him, such as Martin Luther, Luther King Jr. of the United States and Malcolm X and so on. They were all inspired by Marcus Garvey. Now, Garvey was a separatist. What do we mean by that, a separatist? It means that Garvey, at heart, he believed that we as black people could not advance in a white society because the whites owned all the means of protect production. They were the ones who controlled the economy and the politics and therefore there was no justice for us. So Garvey advocated for us as black people to become self-sufficient, to learn to do our own things. But we don't really love that, you know, we're very dependent. We love foreign stuff, we love foreign food and we love foreign clothes and that kind of thing to this day. Those things are happening. So he encouraged us to educate ourselves. Because if we did not educate ourselves, then we would not know where we were going. And we had no tools to fight and to become somebody, to smodify ourselves. All right? So he encouraged blacks to educate themselves, to, to get an education. He encouraged blacks to establish their own businesses and stop working for the white man establish their own businesses, make their own monies, employ other black people to work with you so that, as, so that the black community could create an empire of its own. So I did not believe that we could survive in a white man's world because it was already, the odds were already skewed against us. And then now he also advocated for repatriation to the African continent for blacks. Right? And this is a sticking point. This was one of the points where W.E.B. Du Bois disagreed with him. Right? He believed that each group should occupy their own spaces in order to prevent conflict and encourage growth of the black man. So that is what separatism is. Okay, So you stay over there, sir, and I stay over here. And you do what you are doing because you are white. You, have, or you, you know what you have in common. We have certain things in common as black people. So we should stay where you know, we could grow together. And that is what Garvey really looked at. But some persons may say that Garvey's ideas were fantastic. You know, I mean, ships to take people back to Africa. And persons argue, but me not come from Africa. I was born here, so why would I need to go back to Africa? You know, these are the kinds of arguments, and we still have those kinds of arguments. No, no, I'm not advocating for us to repatriate to Africa necessarily. But when we look at the general idea that Garvey had, then that is much more important. The principles and ideas of Marcus Garvey were much more important. So Dubois disagreed with Garvey. Because Dubois was an intellectual, right? And he was looking, from, looking at black consciousness from a certain level. While Garvey was dealing with the grassroots people, right? So the common, regular, normal black person who needed to elevate himself, who needed to educate himself, who needed to open his own barbershop, open your own hair salon, you know, open your own transport sector, and that kind of thing, because they didn't want the blacks in North America to ride on the buses. Of course, this was a little bit later on. So why, why not build your own transport se sector and have it and use it for yourselves as black people? But Dubois and Garvey did not see eye to eye on some issues. And students, let me hasten to point out that 
we will not be able to cover all of the details of this topic. This is a very lengthy topic. We won't be able to cover all of the details here. You will need to go and do some reading to have a deeper understanding of what was happening in the situation between Garvey and Dubois. Okay? Now, Garveyism is ours. We are the ones who he intended for, his own Jamaican people, but he had to go somewhere else. And then it was after everybody else started revering Garvey that we started to revere Garvey as well. All right? So we know some famous quotes of Garvey. I don't know about you. Well, if you are in the age group 30 and beyond, then you would know what I'm talking about. At school, primary school, we had to line up every morning and afternoon, and we had to recite our Marcus Garvey quotes. And I remember this one very clearly. If you lack confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. With confidence, you have won before you have even started. Of course, it never sounded like that. We all were singing it like a song because that is how we sound at primary school. But it's chalk in our brains and I've never forgotten them. How about this one? The black skin is not a badge of shame, but rather a glorious symbol of national greatness. And I particularly love this one. God and nature first made us what we are. And then, by our own created genius, we make ourselves what we want to be. Yes, these, were, these are famous Marcus Garvey quotes. Of course, we all know some, you know, even if you were not made to recite them. How about, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. That was not written by who we know sang it, which is Bob Marley. That was actually written by Marcus Garvey. He said, emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. So are Garvey's ideas still relevant for today? What do we think? Think about it. What are the things about our society and about what's, what are the things that are wrong with our society that make Garvey's ideas relevant even today. Think about it. We'll come back to that a little bit more as we go into the lesson. All right, so we move on now into some other black consciousness ideas and ideologies and traditions. And we come to ours again, Rastafari. All right? So Rastafari, and we, we, we can readily identify with Rastafari because it, indeed, it's, it is indigenous to us. Not just as Caribbean, but as Jamaican, it is indigenous to us. It is both an ideology and a religion. But the Rastas don't say that. They say it's a liberty, right? It's a liberty, which means that it is what they do every day. It is their everyday practice. You know, they're vegan eating. They're um, removing themselves away from the capitalist society and the greed of the society and living very simple, simple lives. Yes. Now, Rastafari derived out of a mixture of Garveyism, Ethiopianism, revivalism, and it advocates for repatriation. It challenges the status quo. Babylon. Bona fire, we know all of those things, right? And it challenges capitalism. It proposes self-sufficiency. If you notice, most of the times, persons who are inclined to Rastafari plant their own food, you know, run their own little businesses and so on. Coming out of Garvey's ideas, black consciousness and awareness and nationalism, right? And they believe in Haile Selassie, the black Christ. No, it was actually a prompting of Garvey that caused them to actually look to Haile Selassie the first of Ethiopia. Garvey supposedly made a prophecy that said a king would arise from the east and it was just about that time that Haile Selassie came to power and he was able to withstand the invasion of Italy and then eventually they were invaded by Italy and taken over. It was the last African country standing that was not completely colonized by a white nation. 
All right? So we take a break from those ideas now to an economic idea that I want to touch on very, very, very quickly. Industrialization by invitation. This is an economic concept, an economic ideology proposed by Sir Arthur Lewis in the 1960s. And it's really said that Caribbean people should inject the Caribbean countries and economies because we're so dependent and we do not have the means ourselves to grow our economies. We should deliberately invite foreign direct investment, investors to come in and to, to invest in our economies and then we would, we would reap the benefits from it, especially in terms of labor, employment. So those economies would be sugar, banana, tourism, bauxite, and we were largely, we were always largely monocrop or monoculture, meaning that we plant or tend to focus on one main kind of industry. All right? So that was Arthur Lewis's industrialization by invitation. He got this idea from another similar concept called Operation Bootstrap that was implemented earlier in the 1900s in Puerto Rico. And they did the same thing in Puerto Rico, right? They de literally decided we were going to pull ourselves up by our boots and find a way to invest so that we can grow the economy. And that is what Puerto Rico did. However, there are some negatives to this and you can do your additional reading to get some more information about both of these, industrialization by invitation and Operation Bootstrap. Okay, so we'll touch just very, very briefly before we go to break on some other perspectives that are, that are maybe not so common, but we still need to know about. And let me just emphasize that you need to do your additional reading. So we have Indo-Caribbean thought. What, the, what is this? We're looking at people who emigrated from India largely and have come to live in the immediate post-slavery period, the 1840s, 1850s, they came to live in the Caribbean. And they have their own culture. And so they would like political rights and cultural rights, religious acceptance, and so on. Some very popular one, the most popular of them would be V.S. Naipaul, a famous writer. And then we have another perspective, the indigenous perspectives. We're talking about indigenous people, groups of indigenous people who live in Belize, Suriname, Guyana, Trinidad, and, and Dominica, and so on. They are the ones. They have certain rights that they would like, civil, political, cultural rights that they would like. All right, so we don't have time to go into detail for most of these perspectives. You will have to do your own reading, right? And when we come back, we are going to do our or famous multiple choice challenge. Stay with us. Schools that out, we'll be right back. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with a cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. COVID-19 tip. Protect yourself and others from getting sick by washing your hands after coughing or sneezing when caring for the sick before, during, and after you prepare food, before eating, after toilet use, when hands are visibly dirty, and after handling animals or animal waste. The Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, along with TVJ, present Schools Not Out, CSEC and CAPE Lessons, live Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, with weekly Schools Not Out tutorial sessions on Saturdays from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Schools Not Out, live CSEC and CAPE Lessons, here on TVJ. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with a cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. 
a message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. COVID-19 tip. Protect yourself and others from getting sick by washing your hands after coughing or sneezing when caring for the sick, before, during and after you prepare food, before eating, after toilet use, when hands are visibly dirty and after handling animals or animal waste. The Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, along with TVJ, present Schools Not Out, CSEC and CAPE Lessons, live Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, with weekly Schools Not Out tutorial sessions on Saturdays from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Schools Not Out! May I say something to you to give you a true knowledge of yourself and life? so that the same glory and success attained by other men who understand themselves may be yours. Man in the full knowledge of himself is a superb and supreme creature of creation. When man becomes possessor of the knowledge of himself, he becomes master of his environment, the captain of his own ship, the director of his own destiny, the accomplisher of his own ends. Man should understand himself because man is full of knowledge, and this knowledge is a gift of nature. When Mother Nature created man, she deprived him of nothing. He was given the faculty of understanding all things around him. This faculty for understanding has not been taken away from him. None of his senses have been taken away from him. So there is no excuse for the black man in lacking the knowledge that man is used to beautify the world and produce all that he needs for his happiness and civilization. Look the world over and whatever you see in it that is pleasing to man, contributing to man's comfort, to his needs and to his satisfaction, it is but the work of man. Man blessed with the knowledge of himself and the understanding of all things around him. If you are able to live with the knowledge of yourself and with the greater knowledge of nature... Welcome back to Schools Not Out, where we are discussing Caribbean studies. Now, we, you would have heard that clipping just now of Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey's voice. And he was speaking about the need for man, and not just man, but the black man, and by extension, the black woman, the black race, to fortify themselves, to become educated, to learn something. Because it is through education that we will be able to lift ourselves up out of the destitute situations we were left with from our history. And that is what Marcus Garvey was emphasizing on. And so we go back to the question that I had asked earlier. Are Marcus Garvey's teachings still relevant for today? I hope you were giving it some thought during the break. And I would, have, I would love to hear what you are discussing now in your living rooms. Does Marcus Garvey's teachings, do they still have a part to play in our society? Should we still be considering them? My answer to that is categorically yes. Because it's still obvious that we all do not understand ourselves. We all do not understand who we are and the strength that is within us. And what we are able to do, we have not yet maximized our full potential. And so Marcus Garvey's teachings will always be relevant. Because there will always be a new generation that needs to hear or that needs to be reminded. Yes. So that is exactly what we are doing now. School's not out. We are learning. We're still fortifying ourselves through education, even though the schools are physically closed. All right? So we move on now to focusing a little in this last segment on some multiple choice questions that would come out of this topic, intellectual traditions. That's what we're going to be focusing on now. And if you notice, I have on my screen my brain that famous brain. By the time we are through here, this brain must be, will be embedded in your own brain because it is time to use your own brain. And say so the light bulb's going off again, you need to begin to think about the questions and answers. But first, let us be reminded about how we are to master the multiple choice. First, it is important to be very knowledgeable and familiar with the content. Right? So 
what we just did was just a little snippet. You need to now go and do your additional reading in order to be able to answer the questions. Because multiple choice tests content. If you don't know your content, then you, cannot, you, you will not be able to answer the questions. Right? And I know some of us may be thinking, okay, we are, we are at the multiple choice um, level now to do the exam. And it may be easier. It may not be so easy as you're thinking. You will have to do your reading. Seek out the key terms in the question, the dates, the names that will help you to answer the question. They provide clues. Use the process of elimination, discarding the most unlikely first and then working your way to the answer. Pay attention to the superlatives, the most, the best, the, you know, those kinds of words that will help you to answer the question. And then we go to our acronym that we use for multiple choice. Not PEEL now, PEEL we use for writing SBAs as well as for writing essays. For the multiple choice, we use READ. Remember READ? Read, R, you read the question at least twice before you attempt to answer. E, you examine all the responses and eliminate the distractors. A, you attend to the key terms and superlatives that give clues for the answer. And D, you, the, you then determine the best answer based on the responses given. Note the best answer based on what is in front of you. All right. Sometimes the answer may be a little bit controversial. All right. So let's look at this question now. We, remember, we're looking at intellectual traditions. Let, let us look at a few of the questions that relate to intellectual traditions. And this question says, Garveyism, which occurred in the 20th century, is an example of cultural. Now we're looking at the responses there. We have erasure. We have renewal. We have norming, we have diversity. Now, this may be one of those controversial questions. You may be thinking that the right answer is not here, but you are expected to give an answer based on the responses that are here. Obviously, it couldn't be erasure. Why would Gavi be advocating cultural erasure? So you eliminate that one, right? Is it diversity? Not necessarily. How about norming? and renewal. It would have to be between those two. And based on what we have here in terms of the responses, the most likely answer. Now, note I did not say correct. I said the most likely answer based on the responses that are given to you. That would be B, renewal. Okay? And then we move to the next question now, which says, which of the following was the most important determining factor of one's position in colonial plantation society? Now, you will recall that pyramid that we would, your teacher would have drawn or you would have seen in your textbook showing the divisions in the society. And we, there is one factor that usually determines where you are. Or the, it is the main factor. There are others, but that is the main factor. So that's what you're looking for. The most important determining factor. And we have A, race, B, class, C, wealth, and D, place of origin. And the most likely answer for that question would be race. Because obviously, remember, if you are black, you were a slave and therefore you were at the bottom of the society. If you were white, it didn't matter whether you were rich or poor, you would naturally be at the top of the pyramid. So it was race. All right, next question. Which of the following syncretic religions had its early beginnings in Jamaica? That's easy. We just looked at that a while ago. So we have A, Shango, B, Voodoo, C, Revivalism, and D, Rastafarianism. Obviously, the answer is D. That is our indigenous religion. Next one. Early 19th century writings from an indigenous perspective served to, and I'll just cut it short here, the answer for this question is D. Reject the notion held by Europeans that early inhabitants did not have a history. And so they're bringing focus to their history. All right, so we don't have time for much more, but there are several past paper questions that come. You may want to seek out these questions for, for the exams in past years and run through those questions. All right, so that's all we have time for for today. Go and do your, your additional reading. 
I really hope you grasp something, some of the concepts that we discussed today. You can catch a repeat of today's lesson on JNN today at 5 p.m. And in the School's Not Out highlights on Saturday between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. right here on TVJ. It also will be on video on demand on One Spot Media. Until next time, I am Melissa Beckford Simpson saying to you, walk good, wash those hands, and remember Marcus Garvey's teachings. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. <laughs>